So no regrets then? No, none at all. I think it was one of the best decisions I made in my life. Mm -hmm. Or we made, because it was a joint decision. Mm -hmm. You were not included in the decision making. <laughs> I think it worked out for you guys too. That's my dad, Julian Catanio, talking about his immigrant experience. Up next on the All Things Risk podcast. Welcome back to the All Things Risk podcast. I'm Ben Catanio. I'm your host. This is my show all about risk and uncertainty across all walks of life. And this is a very special episode for me because my guest is none other than my dad, Julian Catanio. My dad is a retired university professor. He taught business administration at the University of Windsor in Ontario, Canada. And that's where he is based now, but that's not where he was born, nor was it where I was born. And this conversation is based on his and my mom's decision to move from Argentina to North America in 1977. I was four years old at the time, so I didn't have much input or any input into this decision. My sister was one. And that is a major decision to make in life, the decision to immigrate to another country. And I wanted to explore the whys and the hows of that with him and to share that with you as I think there's a lot here that perhaps you can take away. At least I hope there is a lot here that you can take away. And I have to say, it's very nice, but also a bit strange to have an interview with your dad. And I recorded this in early March in Canada. I was there at the time. I'm normally based in the UK, in London, I was visiting, and this was just before the lockdown and the declaration of the coronavirus pandemic. And like many of you who may have parents or older loved ones in your life, you, number one, don't know when you might be able to see them again, and also you're perhaps concerned for their well-being because of what this virus does to older people. And in my dad's case, he's also battling cancer at the moment. So it's doubly concerning. So I'm grateful that we could record this episode. And in this conversation, he shares the context around life in Argentina in the 1970s and the reasons to move to Canada by way of the United States, as you'll hear, how he made the decision, the push and the pull of the decisions one might make to immigrate to another country, life in North America, how the decision worked out. And I also took the opportunity to ask my dad if there were any rules or a kind of philosophy to how he leads his life. And I hope you enjoy this. So here is my dad. morning and glad to be here with a little <laughs> bit of trepidation. Okay. Dad, how are you? I'm okay. Okay. Welcome to the, okay. the All Things Risk podcast. Thank you. That's Pleasure to have you on. Well, that's interesting. I've listened to over a hundred of them, so it's kind of funny to be recording one. Fantastic. It's a very, it's a great experience to record one with you. So, Okay, well... I know who you are, but my listeners don't know who you are. No, than... and they have no reason to either. And so, could you tell them who you are? Okay, so what I say now is that I'm a retired business prof. That's what I did for a bunch of time. Here in Canada? I've been in Canada since 1980. Mm -hmm. and uh, But grew up in Argentina, did a first educational degree in Argentina at university, worked in several businesses in a number of different uh, occupations, as you will, because I taught school, I was in sales, I was in uh, production planning, and I, for several years I was in uh, human resources management at Ford of Argentina. Okay. Maybe the other thing that is kind of relevant or affected 
my life afterwards was that I grew up in what could be called the Anglo-Argentine community in Buenos Aires, which meant I had the good fortune of growing up bilingual mm -hmm. with uh, not having to learn the languages, but people around me spoke them. And uh, so that was more or less where it started way back when. Most people don't think of Argentina, I believe, unless Messi does something wonderful. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's a strange place in some regards. It was a very prosperous country at one time, and now most people use it as an example of how not to run a country. Mm -hmm. And that was more or less the start of, I think, what you were thinking of, well, I left, obviously. Yes, you left <laughs> in 1977. In 1977. I was four, and you were 13. Well, I was 77, I was 34. Okay. So, why leave then? Why leave at all? Yeah, let's, uh, talk, uh, let's talk about... I want to focus the conversation on why you left and the decision and the pre and the post. Okay, we can So do maybe that. we can start with the pre yeah. and uh, what was going on, your career trajectory. You mentioned working in businesses and sales and you also have a teaching background. Yeah. So let's point out just one thing that I think matters in this sense. We're talking about somebody leaving where they grew up and going to someplace else. And when people do that, they either do it because something is pushing them out mm -hmm. or something is pulling them to wherever it is. And in our case, it was a combination of both. I wanted to do something different, but there was no reason I wanted to stay. So that might need a little bit of explanation. Argentina, 1970s. At that time, I had been working in... Um, a management position in Ford and Human Resources from about 72, I believe, mm -hmm. end of 72. Uh, I had done some other things at Ford purchasing and so on, but uh, I finished my degree in sociology and got an offer to transfer to this other position, and I kind of enjoyed it. But at that time, there was a military government. There was some guerrilla activities of different kinds, and as a matter of fact, as a consequence of that guerrilla activity, the for the company I worked for had, I would say, about half dozen to dozen, uh, mainly American executives were actually killed mm. in different actions. And uh, so the uh, government, the military government, decided to call elections in 1973. Peron was elected president. Democracy had returned. But the guerrilla groups, of which they were Peronista guerrilla groups and not Peronista guerrilla groups, they didn't stop doing some of the things they were doing. So as a, as a consequence, um, you heard these bombs going off and you heard of people getting hurt and some of my close colleagues were actually hurt in attacks. You kind of get used to those things, but you don't want to get used to those things. The uh, government started pressing against the guerrilla groups of the democratically elected government of Perón did start something they called the Alianza Argentina Anticomunista, or something like that, AAA, not the Auto Club. And essentially, this was a group that attacked left-wingers under cover of not telling people who they were. So it was an uncomfortable situation. By 76, early 76, the um, military government, the military deposed the president, took over. The impression we had at one moment was that maybe they'd make things tidier, they did not. They, the repression got worse. So on the one hand, you had, if you were working for a foreign company, particularly in a position of power, of some management importance, risks from the guerrillas, 
And on the other hand, if you happen to be vaguely left-wing, you were at risk from the government. That's the era of the disappeared, as mm -hmm. people had talked about. The dirty war. The dirty war, yes. I felt a little bit threatened at both ends because I had started a, a PhD in sociology at a university, University of Belgrano, and uh, sociologist to the military mind in Argentina means communist. Mm. So it, it was a, an uncomfortable time. That's really when we started thinking, this is not tolerable and I don't want the kids growing up in, um, in this sort of situation. You may recall being driving down a highway and being stopped by military to check papers, usually not very happy looking people. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it, it was uncomfortable. At the same time, I was beginning to feel that I wanted to do something more academic instead mm -hmm. of... That's why I'd started the sociology program. So we decided we would move, and that was two things. One was to emigrate as such, the usual way people emigrate, and we did only think of Canada in that respect. And the other one, which was a better, in my situation, a better um, bet, if you will, was to get a North American doctorate. Because that meant I could get a scholarship mm -hmm. and some support, so it wouldn't be total get off the boat and find mm -hmm. out, now what do I do? Right. So that's what we did. Now, applying for graduate school at that time is a process that took several months mm -hmm. because it was all letter, back and, back and forth. Yeah, there's no internet or faxes there were, even. There were, no, <clears throat> there were no faxes. There was no, we could do a telex, but it, it was all a letter. So mm -hmm. you write the letter, it takes two weeks to arrive. They read it, it takes two weeks to come mm -hmm. back. Etc. As a matter of fact, one of the places I applied to, I was one day late. Oh. From their deadline of applications, and they said they'd consider me for next year. Okay. <laughs> so that meant that one was out. Mm -hmm. So anyway, it, it boiled down to choosing where to go, what kind of program, and eventually choosing a, a school that offered a package. Mm -hmm. That was relatively convenient, and uh, we settled on the University of Michigan. Mm -hmm. So, d just to talk a little bit about, so we talked about the push a little bit. That was a push. That's the push, the political situation. What about the pull? Well, the pull was that I wanted to do, I would like to do an academic type mm -hmm. career doing research, teaching, etc. Mm -hmm. And if the political things weren't happening in Argentina, would you still have continued in your job, do you think? I may have, but I was finding the, uh, the corporate world a little bit stifling. I was mm. doing well. If the political situation continued the way it was and I got promoted, I would have had to have bodyguards, mm. which wasn't nice. If the political situation had been normal, then I probably would have gotten to the stage where the corporate environment was a little bit okay. stifling, if you will. Even though this presumably was a very well-paid job, yeah. relatively speaking, of course, in Argentina at the time. Oh, it was, it, it was a well-paid job by Argentine standards. It was comfortable. It was Sometimes it was fun. Sometimes. Uh, sometimes it was less fun. Uh, there's a lot of, in any organization, there's a lot mm -hmm. of politicking. In some mm -hmm. cases, you can uh, isolate yourself a bit from that. In some cases, no. But, but I also was thinking that if the situation had been non-politically unstable, then what I probably would have liked to do is to move more into consulting. Mm -hmm or research and consulting or something like that. And that also meant higher credentials. I was doing a, a doctorate in sociology, but uh, I don't think it was of the equal level to the one I did here. Mm. It had some things, but still. So 
we left. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Was the decision made in increments? Was there a moment where you recall that we've crossed the line in terms of having made a decision I, and we're not going back? Well, partly. It's incremental in the sense that you're doing steps. If you're going to apply for immigration to Canada, as this was, you filled in forms. Uh, there were interviews. It was an entire oh. process. Why Canada? I always liked Canada. Have you you never visited? I hadn't point? visited. I hadn't lived. I have relatives who were living in the U.S. For some reason, the U.S. didn't attract me because, of course, it's a nasty imperialist power. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was part of it. Mm-hmm. But I'd always been attracted by Canada. We had even thought of maybe coming to Canada about six years before that. Mm. That fell through for a number of reasons. We chickened out, Mm. mainly. Is that because you'd had your life already on track? Things were moving in a certain direction? In that case, at that time, five or six years before, the um, political situation was a little bit less dramatic. And uh, among other important things was that I did not yet have my university degree. Mm. And that also meant that would have been harder. Uh, I felt at least mm. that the job possibilities were less. Mm-hmm. But I did apply to some Canadian universities who would have taken me for grad studies even without a degree. Okay. Uh, but it's a different somehow it seemed too risky. Okay. Uh, this seemed a little less risky, uh, although it was more risky because there were two kids mm-hmm. involved as part of the deal. And uh, but two it, it's increm- and, mm-hmm. two kids and a graduate scholarship, but that's it to support. Yeah. Well, the thing family. is the. Is it incremental? Yes, it's incremental because you're going through steps. If you're applying to grad school, you're sending in this, you're doing the GMAT, you're doing the Mm -hmm. GRE, you're doing tests. Uh, So all those are not irreversible. But then come the moment when you get uh, applications Mm -hmm. are accepted. Mm -hmm. Okay, now you've got to make a decision. Are we going to take this or not? Mm -hmm. And I got... I think it was five acceptances. One, I recall, from the University of Wisconsin, which by policy does not give scholarships to first-year doctoral students. Mm. So that was up. (laughs) And uh, and so Michigan actually gave us a a decent package, a graduate assistantship plus a scholarship, plus they had student housing, plus... It was in Ann Arbor, and the headquarters for Ford mm. are in Dearborn. Right. And that meant a bit that I could maintain some contacts mm. through people who were traveling mm. back and forth. And so that made it a bit more attractive. So off we came. Did you go to Dearborn? Sorry? Did you go to Do- Dearborn in your Ford capacity? No. No. I had, there was a chance that I would be sent then, and that had fallen through. So, no. I knew oh. people who had been there. Sure. But I hadn't been there before. Okay. So, I didn't know what okay. I didn't know what Ann Arbor was like. Okay. Um, and did you know that it was across, the 45 minutes away from Canada? Oh, yes. Was that a I, factor? Uh, a bit of a factor, yes. Okay. Um, so, it kind of worked out reasonably. And uh, was there a plan B? Once you've committed to leaving, Mm -hmm. there's not much of a plan B because we had to do a bunch of things. We sold our house. Mm -hmm. Uh, So at some point... And you quit your job? I quit my job, obviously. Um, The the company was very nice and Mm. they let me keep my lease car until I left, even though I... I was quit, I think, for a month or a month and a half mm-hmm. to, um, to to arrange things. Uh, so at one point, it, the point comes when you're committed, this is going to happen, and you move with it. And uh, so it was a bit of jump into 
the unknown, the, the unknown if mm -hmm. you will. Advantages we had, I spoke English, mm -hmm. so, so did your mother, so we could communicate. Um, I didn't speak English. No, you did not speak English, nor did your sister. Picked it up pretty damn fast. Kids are very flexible. Mm -hmm. uh, I have to admit that you were not consulted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I don't know that you would have had much of an opinion mm -hmm. on it, but uh, that's the tough one. But when, when you are committed to go, you move, you've got to pack and all this sort of thing. It was interesting. Mm -hmm. Plus, I don't know if you have told you the anecdote, but we were still in a military government with all its wonders of assuming that everybody they don't like is a communist. Uh, we called a moving company to pack things, and they came to the house and they looked and they saw some uh, books in my in the living room, and then. The fellow said, okay, he's up some books, that's okay. No, says your mother, there's more books upstairs. I had an office. And of course I had all my sociology books mm -hmm. there. And the fellow, my, my husband's a sociologist, he tells him, and he says, oh no, one of those. <laughs> and actually the fellow looked at some of the books and said, you better not take those because they're going to be packed and you'll still be here. And that was a scary thought. Mm. So there's books that remain really behind mm. uh, because of fear. So that was it. It was a very different feeling from, I think, most people. Because arriving in, in the States was, in that case, liberating. Mm. No more military. Mm. Uh, and essentially what I had in Ann Arbor as a doctoral student was a nine-to-five job. Mm. I went to my undergraduate office and I read books there and did coursework and taught something and maybe brought some work home, but it was a full-time job. Mm -hmm. Which didn't pay them, didn't pay for it well no. at all. No. So we did go through savings and stuff that was a bit problematic. But in many respects it was easy. Mm. And in many respects, it wasn't. So, can we talk about the respects that it was and wasn't? Well, what was easy, I had a structure. Mm -hmm. I had a salary. Mm -hmm. I had nice colleagues. Mm -hmm. Profs were fine. I got along with them. So now We lived in a very nice graduate student community. That, I recall that that was a wonderful place to grow up or spend a few years growing up. That we felt that those... They used to call it married student housing at the mm. time. I don't call it something else. That was also wonderful because everyone in that area was more or less in the same boat. They were studying different things, but they were all grad students. Mm. They had kids. Mm. And uh, for kids, all it meant was walk out the door and there was somebody to play with, mm -hmm. uh, which we couldn't do in Argentina. Mm -hmm. So the that overall environment was good. The The... The university had some supportive mechanisms for foreign students that made uh, adapting easier. And uh, I, I must say, Ann Arbor, for a grad student, was a great place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a nice community. The university has all sorts of things. It was, those are, I think, the bigger pluses. Are there negatives? Well, yeah, we didn't have enough money. Mm -hmm. That's a normal, given. We lose contact with family and friends. Mm. And more than now that you can Skype with your mm. relatives all the time and see what they look like, there you wrote a letter and mm. it took, as we said, two weeks to arrive, mm -hmm. two weeks to come back. Occasionally, if we wanted to splurge, we could talk on the phone mm -hmm. with a... a lost connection, but I think one of the things lose, in particular, the kids lose, is where are the cousins, where are the uncles, mm -hmm. where are the, the grandparents, and that was, uh, we had some relatives in New York, which was helpful, mm -hmm. but basically all the people we used to see regularly disappeared. Mm -hmm. 
occasionally somebody who worked at Ford would come and visit and mm. drop by and we'd reminisce, mm -hmm. but that was it. So that's, uh, it was livable, mm -hmm. but yes, it is, it is a clash. And there were no, there were very few Latinos in the program also, mm. people I could speak Spanish to. So not that I looked for them either. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that I think is important in my case is that I decided this was a cut and a new life. Mm. I even changed my signature. Mm. You didn't know that. The signature I used in, in Argentina ceased to exist. And that's also when signatures were a big thing too. Well, they were a big thing, but you see the Argentine signature is by definition illegible. Uh -huh. And Americans prefer to be able to kind sure. of make out what the name says. So I changed my signature to something that people could read. Okay. Uh, but that's a change. Yeah. <laughs> a silly one maybe, but... Uh, so that was part of it. The other thing that made things easier is that uh, universities in North America are much better organized than they were in Argentina, at least uh -huh. at the time. So things like registering for courses worked. Mm -hmm. Things like, uh, can you find textbooks? Yes. Uh, Argentina, you had to struggle more mm -hmm. to get what you needed to do what you... Was there a lot of corruption in the university system in Argentina? I did not notice it, but there must have been, mm. because there's corruption everywhere. Mm. No, it was just messy. Mm -hmm. I spent a year and a half getting credit for a course that I had passed mm. because somebody had forgotten to sign a document that said I had this course. It would have been easier for me to take another one. Mm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but I mean, that sort of thing normally doesn't, mm -hmm. doesn't happen mm -hmm. here. So uh, I do recall one of my advisors in Argentina, she was one of the professors at uh, University of Belgrano, and she said, you'll, you'll do fine. Argentines do fine overseas because it's so difficult to do well here <laughs> when you go to some place where things mm -hmm. work you do fine mm -hmm. okay so what about the any thoughts you had about our schooling and education and entering schooling without speaking the language fully well what by concerns the, did no, you have well but by the time schooling rolled around yeah. you, you guys spoke English yes you you picked up English in six months. Oh, okay. that's my memory. Okay, it was amazing how fast kids can adapt. Mm -hmm. uh, so that wasn't a problem. I worried about it a little bit, but only mm -hmm. a bit. There, there were good preschool facilities that helped mm -hmm. with the adaptation, uh, friendship, international, mm -hmm. and so on. So that wasn't problematic. Other things. You have some idea of, everybody knows what the United States yes. is like. Yes. Everybody outside of the States knows what it's some like. Some idea. Well, you've seen the movies. Yes. <laughs> so you know what it's like. So you don't know what it's yes. like. Yeah. In essence, mm. uh, the country is, can surprise you at how different it is from your preconceptions. And uh, Ann Arbor was different, partly because of this enormous population of grad students, some of whom were foreign. Mm -hmm. My first encounter with uh, ethnic diversity was really in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. There's not much of there was not much of it in Argentina, but this is the first place I saw people from Saudi Arabia, men in their white robes mm -hmm. together, and then you'd have all sorts of the first massive encounter with people from India. Mm -hmm. I'd only met two people from India in my life before that. Chinese. I mean, I'm talk, not talking of Chinese Americans. I'm talking about Chinese mm. students and so on. So you you find that you had to start getting adapted to accents. Sometimes your mm. TA might be uh, from somewhere else, and you had to make your ear mm. accustomed to a way of talking. You survive it. Were there? What other things surprised you about the United States and North America culturally, or about how things worked that you just didn't? Well, I'm trying to remember. Have anticipated. I'm trying to remember even back. simple things like grocery shopping, or <laughs> I'm trying to remember back to the uh, those days. But bunch of things. Mm -hmm. 
an enormous amount of packaging yeah compared to where we came from that was you know, the um, grocery shopping was different not dramatically different there was supermarkets in Argentina we did go to supermarkets but there was no local grocery stores mm -hmm. that you could go out and shop for the day and so all those having to move from a place where you shopped daily for food you shop mm. for what you were going to eat that day to a place where you shop for a week worth of food was a mental change and had to do some plus of course on a more practical basis the way north americans eat because canadians share the much of the american style is different than argentines partly uh, timing wise so lunch is an important meal in Argentina. It took us a while to decide that sandwiches for lunch was okay. Mm. And uh, dinner at six-ish took some getting used to because mm. six is tea time still. Eventually you get used to it and it works fine, but those things change. Discovering what foods are eaten, what foods you can get. Were there foods you missed? That you there were wish? a few. I, I don't miss them now, but Dulce was one. I was never a big Bante drinker, so that I didn't miss. Oh, I, I did find in the first years that American coffee was atrocious. <laughs> uh, still is, but it uh, took, uh, took a while to find solutions. There was no Starbucks then. Mm -hmm. So finding a decent cup of coffee was difficult. Uh, American breakfasts are different. Uh, so the, all the foodstuffs and so on, social relationships are different. Mm. Uh, Americans are more distant mm -hmm. in many regards than, uh, than Argentines. Uh, an anecdote told by Argentine friends who came to Ann Arbor and were, they arrived after we did, and they were assigned by the school, somehow, a couple. The first week took them around and took them shopping and helped them find this, and it was wonderful. And that was it. It was one week. Hmm. <laughs> they didn't hmm. see them again. Right. And that's, that kind of felt unusual. Yes. So, we did make good friends, but it was a bit more difficult. Mm. Also, it's difficult to make really good friends in student housing. Right. We all know we're transitory. Yes. So, if you really get friendly with someone and they leave next year mm -hmm. because they graduate, mm -hmm. they're gone. Mm -hmm. And that's, we've kept touch with some of those people, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it's difficult to have community mm -hmm. in that sense. Mm -hmm. What else? It's and then of course there's the the fact that I spoke English. I spoke English well, but I didn't speak American English. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot in everyday conversation that is rooted in the activities the community does. So like sports mm -hmm. metaphors mm -hmm. or you know, the whole nine yards and mm -hmm. three hits and three strikes and you're out. Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of expressions that if you're not aware of the sport uh, go yeah. straight over your head. Yeah. And then you moved to Canada. We moved to Canada three years three, later. Uh, almost three years later. Mm -hmm. I got an offer from the University of Windsor and I hadn't finished the doctorate so it was very convenient to be close to Ann Arbor to be able to finish and that was a change mm. in many regards. First, no student housing. Mm. Our neighbors did not go to university. No. Our neighbor on one side was an RCMP officer and on the other side was a truck driver. Mm -hmm. Lovely people, but mm -hmm. let's say difference. we had less in common <laughs> than we had mm -hmm. in Ann Arbor. So that was one difference. The town is completely different. Ann Arbor is very much the academic town. Windsor is an industrial town. Mm -hmm. um, no mail on Saturdays. Mm -hmm. That was a change. No newspaper on Sundays. 
that was a change. You couldn't buy beer or wine on mm-hmm. Sundays. Mm-hmm. Things have changed since then, mm-hmm. but those are little things. That, I mean, face it, Detroit and Arbor, Windsor don't look all that different. The houses look the same and so on, but there were a number of mm. practices that, oh, oh. <laughs> That's unusual. Oh. Mm. Canada was metric, mm-hmm. which made a lot of sense, but I had learned cold weather in Ann Arbor. Mm. So I had to learn to mm. recalculate. Is it cold when it's three Celsius? Mm-hmm. But it was in some respects easier, but now I was a prof. Right. So that is a different kettle of fish. Right. And all of a sudden I'm walking down the quad here in Windsor and some student stops me to ask me a question in a direction and called me sir. <laughs> yes. I wasn't that much old. I was about 37 at the time, but they called me sir. Mm-hmm. Nobody in an Arbor would call you sir because they'd assume I was a grad student. Mm-hmm. Sir. Mm-hmm. Were there other cultural things between Argentina and Canada and Arge- and Canada and the U.S. that struck you? Yeah, well, they strike you. The uh, traffic is more orderly in this part of the world. Uh-huh. People are, well, among other things, people insult differently. Okay. And this is something we've talked about. Uh, there is a universal gesture in North America, which is the finger. Yes. Uh, which at the time we came up north, we knew of it in Argentina, but for movies. Nobody used that. There's a different equivalent gesture when you're trying to insult somebody. But the thing is, I always thought it was cute. You know, if somebody swears at you, if somebody swears at me in Russian, it does nothing to me Mm. because I don't know what they're saying. So Mm. that was the kind of thing. So shortly after we'd arrived in Windsor, I was driving and normally, and somebody, unusual in Canada, but it happened, somebody passed me and cut me off and stuck out his hand out of the window and gave me the finger. And the adrenaline surge I felt was, I was furious. (laughs) I could have shot him, I suppose. But then I, I stopped down and I said, oh boy, I've gone native. Mm. Now, now I'm a Canadian. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that happens with a few things. At the time we came, words like the N-word was not said, but hadn't, re- hadn't yet uh, become as unsayable as it is today. But still... But again, it was a word that didn't mean much to me. I hadn't grown up mm-hmm. with it. I hadn't, I'd only read it. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a number of expressions that uh, don't mean the same thing. Another thing that I had to learn, Argentines are, are quite blind, I'm trying to say this politely, to the impact or to the negative impact of racist comments. Mm. In other words, people will be described regularly by their physical appearance. Mm. So somebody who happens to be born in China will mm. probably be called among this group the Chinese. And they will make jokes about skin color and uh, mm being Jewish or things like that, that are quite common. And I don't know how the people who receive them feel, but when you push back to someone who said something like that, they kind of blankly look at you, what's your problem? You, we're much more sensitive here in the States and in Canada. So there's expressions we don't use, and actually, occasionally, even today, I find it shocking when I speak to people in Argentina that 
they could make that joke. Mm. It's also a more sexist society than here, too. Mm. People don't realize it, and in some th- ways it's less sexist than here. In what ways? Well, and there's, there's a lot of professional women. Mm-hmm. Maybe in some professions different than, more than than here, but there, that is changing. But uh, it also means that you've got to adapt yourself to a different society. You're living in a different society. Did you ever think about going back? Really? No. Mm -hmm. Uh, When I was still in Ann Arbor, I wrote an article for The Dividend which was the uh, university magazine, on my experience managing pay in Argentina. Okay. Because I was, I was responsible for uh, pay for the salaried employees of Ford, and this at a time when uh, inflation was high. So we were actually giving general pay raises every three months, <laughs> on average, which meant all sorts of analysis. So I wrote about this. And uh, I actually got a... This magazine went out to alumni, and I actually got a phone call from an alumnus who um, tells wanted me to perhaps consider becoming the industrial relations manager for the uh, DuPont subsidiary. In Argentina? In Argentina. Mm-hmm. This was only two years after we'd left, mm-hmm. no. Mm-hmm. Uh, I did consider one possible return uh, about 15 years ago, there was a chance for a, what I was told was a deanship, but it was a department headship at one of the universities to run the business school of, at a private university. And I did consider it seriously. Mm-hmm. We went, we interviewed. Somehow, it didn't add up. Mm. So, no, I, I like visiting. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm pretty happy visiting because visiting means among other things I don't have to do any legal work uh, dealing with bureaucracy we talked about difference dealing with bureaucracy in Argentina is much more difficult than in North America uh, if you want an anecdote of how people think about things when we were coming I needed a passport way back. I didn't have a passport in Argentina because I hadn't traveled abroad. So, what do you do if you need a passport in Canada is, where's the passport office? Where do I get the forms? And you go and get the forms and fill them out and whatever. In Argentina, I said I need a passport. So, I went to see the chap who handled all the foreign travel and so on in the the office and said, Charlie, I need a passport for my family. What do I do? So he gave me a card with his name mm. and wrote the name of a commissario on the, mm. other, on the other side. And he said, okay, you go to the headquarters of the police and give him this card. <laughs> In other words, the first thing you think about is not what's the process, but who right, do I know? You're right, right. And not only was that, but <clears> the... I expected when I went to see this gentleman that I would be given some sort of priority Mm. going through the... Well, yes, I was given a priority. They had two parallel processes for managing people through the passport process because it's done differently than here. At the time, it was done differently. You went in and you put your forms and the... They took ink your fingers and they took a picture and there were different places where you did this. They had two parallel lines. Mm. One for the people who knew somebody and another one for the people who didn't. And a lot of things are Mm. still kind of like that. Yeah. Uh, The Latin American countries, Argentina in particular, also have a figure called the gestor, which I believe exists in other countries. And that is someone who you use, you hire, to run your paperwork through the bureaucracy. They're the ones who know that you should see this one before that one, and maybe I should give this one a little gift. Okay. 
So pretty powerful hire, position. Yeah, but unless you, for some things, unless you hire a historian, it'll take you forever. Mm -hmm. Because it's the old joke, you know, go to window A and then mm -hmm. window B and window C is closed. Mm -hmm. And well, this guy knows which windows to mm -hmm. go to and which not. Uh, actually, they have offices. Mm. Gestor, gestoria. Okay. Again, that yeah. does not exist here. Yes. I mean, I'm not saying that there isn't uh, who you know doesn't work here. It does, but it's at a much, much higher level. Yeah. So no regrets then? No, mm -hmm. none at all. I think it was one of the best decisions I made in my life. Mm -hmm. or, or we made, because it was a joint decision. Mm -hmm. You were not included in the decision making. I think it worked out for you guys too. Breaking that down in terms of elements of making that decision, there was some incremental things. There was push and pull, and there was also a point where you crossed the line and didn't go back. Yeah. I mean, probably if I had finished my uh, s studies in Argentina a bit earlier, I might have decided to do what some people did, which was to come to North America, get a PhD, maybe stay a couple more years and then go back. Mm -hmm. People used to do that. Mm -hmm. And at some time, I might have. By the situation was such when we left that the decision was I was not going back. Mm -hmm. And I also think that that helped us adapt mm. because I know people who left to study or whatever it is uh, and could never adapt mm. and were sad and mm. went back and I've known of people who went back and then couldn't make it when they went back so they returned to mm. the original country they'd gone to and you're back and forthing uh, so our decision was very much we're okay we're staying here mm -hmm. I think that helped mm -hmm. which is different than a refugee who I think many times they want to go back but mm -hmm. can't and by the time they can things have changed and it's more difficult yeah. I don't really know mm -hmm. yes yeah, it's a different experience that you describe from other types of immigrants who yes. haven't had the benefit of a you know, graduate student community and other people that at least you didn't have, you didn't have other Argentines, but you had other international students that shared the experience. Yeah. And similarly, at the university, you had colleagues, I would have presumed, I know, that also emigrated. Yeah, Even well, though they were from other countries, they had a common, yeah. you had a common experience. Well, I don't know what the proportion is, but a significant proportion of my colleagues were similar to me in the sense that they had come from someplace else, gotten a degree, their, their final degree in the U.S. or Canada, and stayed. So I still have good friends who are Indian. Or, mm -hmm. uh, so they share some of our same problems their motivation for leaving might have been different. Mm -hmm. I think in some cases, what you have is people come. In, in the, the, now I'm talking about the uh, the university kind of person. They come, they get their degree, and they stay. They weren't planning to stay, but it all works mm -hmm. out so nicely that then there is really no reason to go back mm -hmm. except to visit. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, so I don't know how that works. It would be an interesting thing to talk to someone. Can I give a name? Yes. Like uh, Andy Appen, mm -hmm. my colleague and good friend, because he has relatives all over the States. He's Indian. He's Indian. And so does his wife. So mm -hmm. I can't remember where the relatives are. I think one's in Seattle, one's in Chicago, there's somebody in Singapore, there's somebody in Britain, and I don't know if that diaspora mm. is planned. Mm -hmm. In other words, people grow up in an environment where they know they're going to leave. Mm. 
I don't know. I've never discussed that, but it's interesting that you have so many relatives away from the back home. Mm -hmm. And when he celebrated his 70th birthday in India, people were coming from all over the world. Mm -hmm. So is that common? I don't know. It's different than my case because I'm the only one who left. And people get worried ab about immigration, uh, and this is something that's happened throughout history. If yes. you think about the Irish in London, or oh, yeah. the or the Irish in North America, for that matter, yeah. or whomever, and immigrants do change the society in which they they enter. Yes, and that that happens. But the society also changes the immigrants. Yes, both things happen. Uh, one thing uh, I've been able to observe a bit belatedly because we came here in '80, not in the '60s. But mm -hmm. I have friends who came to Canada in the '60s. Mm -hmm. Toronto was not this multicultural mm -hmm. city it is today. Toronto was not as interesting then as it was today, and the food was much worse. Mm -hmm. So yes, the immigrants have come and they've, they've made an impact. The immigrants also get affected by the society in which they are. I think it works both ways. Um, some immigrants have it harder than others because if you look very different or sound very different, there are people who are rejecting, which is mm -hmm. stupid, but that's the way it is. In that sense, we were reasonably fortunate because we don't look that different. No. I recall going to uh, having some instances in which I would tell people, sometimes this still happens, that I'm Argentine. I would say that I, I'm, I'm Argentine. You don't look Argentine. What does or, an Argentine or, look exactly. like? Exactly. <laughs> and similarly, that I had no idea your English is so is is yeah. is so good. I had or or they they thought that maybe I was a Canadian and you were stationed there. We were Canadians and okay. had been born there, but had moved back or this type of a thing. Because physically, we don't. When no, I was well, growing, we don't. We don't necessarily well, what, look. What people aren't aware of in this part of the world is that Argentina, in particular. More than, a bit more than the other Latin American countries, is a country of immigrants. It has a, a, a demographics that is not that different from North America. So the, most Argentines have either Italian or Spanish ancestry, at least. And there's large German and Polish and mm -hmm. even Irish communities. So they don't necessarily look like what a North American thinks a Latino should look mm -hmm. like. Uh, because they're, they're comparing with countries with a much bigger Aboriginal component. Plus, the other thing that sometimes works is that my last name is not Spanish. Mm -hmm. So Americans don't immediately assume that because I have a Spanish name, I'm a Latino. If, mm -hmm. if my name was Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. uh, and for another reason, the majority of Americans don't even realize that the name is Italian. Right. It is, but they right. don't realize it. Right. And I don't sound Italian. Yes. But for others who, who have differences that are more obvious... It, I, it can be, I can imagine it can be incredibly I, I imagine it can be problematic mm -hmm. because when you you look out, your sister does tell me that she had a teacher in elementary school who didn't like immigrants. Wow. And in her case, she knew mm -hmm. she was an immigrant, mm -hmm. even though she didn't look. Wow. I have no idea why this woman didn't like immigrants, because if you come to it and scratch a little bit, unless you're First Nations, everybody in Canada is three generations from the ship. Mm -hmm. They've been longer in Quebec, but basically, mm -hmm. we're all immigrants here. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you make of the current global climate in most Western countries in which anti-immigrant sentiment has 
It's worrisome. Mm -hmm. It's worrisome because it seems to repeat things that happened in the 30s. Mm -hmm. We are... And many And many times before, before. but Mm -hmm. but you're looking at... uh, There are people who are hurting economically Mm -hmm. because of poor government policy, because of technological change. There's this... There's a, a lot of reasons why people aren't getting the jobs they used to get, etc. But the, this populist reaction is to blame somebody. Blame somebody different. Mm. So it's the immigrants who are coming in and taking all our jobs. The immigrants are coming in and stealing. Uh, and in most cases, the evidence suggests that it ain't that Mm-hmm. That uh, if you look at American figures, immigrants are more law abiding than Americans, among other reasons, because the consequences if they get caught doing something illegal are much more hurtful. So they're less likely uh, to be. It's, it's really scary. And, and seeing it happen in what one thought was civilized societies, I mean, sort of things I read about in Britain. Uh, for some reason, it's happening in the States. I am not as aware that it's happening yet in Canada, at least to that degree. They are, there have been some, you've got, uh, what's his name, Barnier? Uh, but uh, I think Canada has been more fortunate in the way people were integrated. Mm-hmm. Because people weren't forced to integrate. People are allowed to celebrate their heritage. So I've, I've found it a more comfortable society for anybody. Mm-hmm. It's, but it's, it's really sad when you see what's happening in Hungary and in Poland mm-hmm. and, and in Italy. And I, can, I can understand some reactions because when you get large numbers of uh, refugees, they can overwhelm the support mm-hmm. systems. That's one thing. But this sort of demonization of the foreign people, this sort of fear that the, the Arabs are swamping the white population, all this sort of nonsense. And some of these people actually believe that. That's mm-hmm. the worst part. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there are problems. I mean, most of the the problem in Europe is, I guess, push immigrants, the ones who who are escaping death and destruction mm-hmm. and famine and all sorts of things. And let's be human. Mm-hmm. But Europe didn't handle it very well because if you recall the significant Turkish origin population in Germany Hmm. started because Germany needed workers, so they they started the Gastarbeiter program. Mm -hmm. So they they brought in people from Turkey, also from Spain, Mm -hmm. and uh, Yugoslavia, I believe, was another supplier. But they they allowed them to stay and work, but they didn't allow them to become permanent. Mm -hmm. So there was no intent to integrate them into society until it, until a long time afterwards, mm-hmm. and that that's a price they have to pay. Mm-hmm. Other immigrant situations, and I mean different people situations. France has a big Arab population because they went to sure. Arab. I mean they controlled Northern mm-hmm. Africa for mm-hmm. so long, and. Uh, I still remember a sign in a demonstration in Britain in the 60s. And these, the, the, and a bunch of Caribbean people, I think they were, and holding up a sign that says, we are here because you were there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now, of course, the uh, Brits have decided that all the immigration problems are due to the European Union. Which they're not. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
Okay. Well, it's uh, it's been a very interesting. I don't know how interesting. Well, it's been very interesting. Uh, I, I, I I found it interesting. Uh, hopefully, my, my <laughs> I don't know if you're my if listeners will as well. Uh, one um, just one thing to touch on was the the academic world w- what you hoped it would be. Uh, overall, yes. Overall, yes. Um, the academic world also has. Uh, I studied at a top-level university, but a public university, mm-hmm. Michigan. I worked at a, I would say, mid-level public university in Canada. So I get the feeling from the people I've met and so on that the atmosphere in the more rarefied institutions, that the ones that rank highly and so on, is can be quite different. Um, There's much more pressure on publishing, much more pressure on... I wouldn't say it's publishing. I think what I notice is a lot more pressure on on having famous profs and winning prizes and so on. So I do believe that there's a difference between what happens there and what happens at a place like Windsor, which essentially, yeah, we want to do good work and we want to get the students through. I do get the impression that there are some academics out there who, if they could eliminate the students, (laughs) they'd be happy to, except that then who's going to do the work? Yes. I, I don't know. But overall, yes, it has been... Uh, a satisfactory life. You get these politics. You've probably heard the saying that university politics are so vicious because the rewards are so small. <laughs> All right. People can get bananas over stupid things. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm. I'm. I'm glad I was an academic. Okay. Uh, Although I always got annoyed when somebody came in April and said, oh, so you're off for the summer. Right. Because I wasn't. Right. I mean, most most academics that I know, there, there are exceptions, they work their tails off. Mm-hmm. Of course, most of the pressure you get is self-inflicted. Mm. Because as, as some university professor and university president once said, you know, running a university is like herding cats. Mm-hmm. Because you really can't get profs to do what you want. No, no. Well, that's why they're in the in that line of work. Yeah, and that's why do sometimes... They want. Yeah, but sometimes that's why you get a business school hiring a top-notch CEO of some place as, as dean, and then they don't work out because... They tell some prof that I want to report on this on my desk tomorrow, and, <laughs> and it won't be. Sorry, <laughs> and it won't be there. Be, mm. But they were used to. That's what mm. you did. In mm. yes, sir. How long do you want it? Mm-hmm. In business, you can do that. In universities, mm-hmm. you can't. And in Canadian universities, you can do it even less because mm-hmm. uh, my experience is that uh, the, the deans, the administration has less power over the faculty than they do in mm-hmm. in, uh, in Ann Arbor. I mean, the, the dean of business a few years ago in Ann Arbor created three new associate deanships, and he made the decision, and he appointed the people, and that was it. You can't do that in Windsor. Mm-hmm. You've got to go through about 16 hoops to get the position approved, and then there's mm-hmm. committees for selection and so on. So that's also a difference. Mm-hmm. Okay, one question I think would be interesting is if you were a 20-year-old now. Hmm. A 20-year-old now where? In, in, let's say, let's do first in Argentina and then let's do second in a place like Canada or, well, let's, let's start with a place like a Western country, a place like the US, Canada or Britain. Most of my listeners will be from one of okay. those or possibly Australia. Um, and you had a similar set of interests, perhaps a slightly similar academic background, or you, you, what, 
what would you be interested in doing and what would you what what things would you possibly do with your life and possibly avoid knowing what you know now <laughs> <laughs> that's a tough one uh, that's a really tough one let's uh, just try it but assuming I was a uh, 20 something in um, you know, Canada to make it easier I'd probably have a, a university degree yeah that's uh, interesting because there's a movement against that uh, no, possibly, but I'm, I'm sort of thinking what you would. Well, right. I I probably you, would have right. at least gone through what inertia takes me mm -hmm. to the end of the four years of of mm -hmm. college. Uh, I don't see myself dropping out after high school. If I were artistically inclined, mm -hmm. uh, that would be different. Mm -hmm. But it's not. Me. At that stage, I'd be wondering what the heck to do. Mm -hmm. Um, because you'd have to sit down and say, what are my skills? What are my interests? I probably would go on to grad school, mm -hmm. probably. But uh, some people find that opportunities come up before that, and you can act on those opportunities and then maybe uh, go to school. The, the risks of... Depends what you want to do. Yeah. Uh, if you want to be an engineer, or you want to build bridges or things like that, you have to do grad school. Mm -hmm. you, for some, for some occupations, you need the credentials even today. Mm -hmm. And if you want to do those occupations, then I think you should achieve those credentials. Mm -hmm. For other things, if you want to be a writer, if you want to even be in business, I don't think you necessarily need a degree. And one other point, I think, that I don't know if I'd go to business school, hmm. even if I wanted to go to business, because there are things that matter, that you can learn, that you can study, that you can think about, that are not taught in business schools. Hmm. Let's face it, I never got an MBA. Mm -hmm. I was a sociologist. Mm -hmm. I studied a PhD in business. I refused to get an MBA. <laughs> I think I can do as good a job as teaching aspects of business as anybody else. Mm -hmm. My MBA friends will be shocked. Mm -hmm. uh, but I have a fear, if you read some of the literature now on business schools, there is quite a challenge that the schools are facing okay. in terms of being relevant and in terms of doing things but that's also a long history of the business. But also it's technology that's driven that. There's so many, there are things you can learn online for very low cost. It's low barrier to entry. It's Yeah, they're, they're I'm, I'm not sure about the online. I've okay. done online courses. I've taught online courses. Sure. Um, but if you're looking for specific skills about oh, if you want finance to... or marketing or... Well, you can learn. Oh yes, if you need a specific set of skills because you're looking at, as you're saying, finance. Uh, yeah, I think you can spend a year with online, good online resources, and and get a very good package of mm -hmm. what you need to know. Mm -hmm. uh, I would think that you can also, if you're into things like uh, computer programming and mm -hmm. so on, there's a heck of a lot of resources. At the same time, sharing physical space mm -hmm. with people and talking to them is also useful. Right. That's why things like Silicon Valley, I think, exist because they're right. all around. Uh, it's uh, what's the risk of all that? The thing that I think would worry anyone now getting started is the risk of being obsolete before you even have time. Mm. You know, you you go to school, you learn all this stuff, and by the time you get onto the workplace or wherever you're trying to apply it, technology has killed it. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's something to be said for learning a range of lateral skills, of being a more of a generalist, of learning some basic things like critical thinking and yeah. skills oh. that, that, that 
that are highly transferable as opposed to becoming an expert in a specific thing that may not exist in five I, years' I time. I fully agree with that. I think critical thinking is a skill that you need. Mm -hmm. uh, you also need a certain level of numeracy. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that you need to be able to solve differential equations. There was a tweet we, we saw this morning about, yes, about the, five, the uh, mm -hmm. Mike Bloomberg's... Mike Bloomberg's 500 million, yes. And he could have given a million to each American. No, 500 million divided by 327 million is not a million. Could have given every American he could one, have given a dollar fifty. A dollar fifty. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And but people obviously were taking that at face value. Of course, because it's it was a tweet from a verified yeah Twitter account holder and someone who has a following and authority and yeah mm -hmm. yeah it's it's kind of amazing you get. I do also think, painfully, in some ways, that we also need more training in, I wouldn't say statistical analysis, but understanding, people don't understand probabilities. Uh, no, they don't. No. So, you know, it's 20% chance of rain, but it's raining now. Yeah, well, you got uh, the 20%. <laughs> Uh, so, it is very difficult for people to understand. Mm. It shouldn't be, but it is. People make conclusions. You know, you flip a coin ten times, it comes out heads ten times. Well, there's two possibilities. One, it'll, it's still 50-50. But if it comes out heads ten times in a row, I'd look at it. Mm -hmm. Because maybe it's got two, <laughs> two sides. Two heads, yeah. But because something happened and it's a 50-50 doesn't mean that the opposite will happen next time. Mm -hmm. A whole bunch of those. Mm -hmm. So we do need to understand more. There's, there's also... Uh, I'm, I'm a good admirer of Ben Goldacre. He's this... Brit medical doctor, he wrote Bad Pharma and okay. Bad Science, and he's very much into uh, the, the problem of testing in medicine, because when uh, new medicines are Test studied, them, compared, study. so on, mm -hmm. they typically test them against placebo, mm -hmm. and they approve it, and this is a new medicine, but that doesn't mean that it's any better than the ones that already exist. Right. So there's, there's this sort of uh, problem. A lot of, uh, there's in, in sciences in general, social sciences included, you don't publish papers that don't give significant results. Mm -hmm. So if a test fails, right. nobody finds out that it failed. Right. There's a selection bias. There's a selection bias. There's, there's, uh, they, they have been essentially what are fraud cases. You heard the case of Wansink, the... Um, the food specialist at Cornell. Hmm. No. Well, a whole bunch of studies that have been retracted since. Okay. But the original studies are still out there and people are still citing them. Hmm. Because it's a published academic work. So Yes, it is. And there there might be an agenda yeah. at play as well. If someone's so, selling a product or you see this a lot in the, the world of marketing where a study will be cited uh, showing that yeah. I don't know if you consume uh, whatever it is, it redu reduces the the, the 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 risk of some disease or something. Well, but for example, the the other thing when we're talking about statistical analysis, they tell you that if you do X, whatever it is, uh, if you eat this thing, your chance of getting this kind of cancer will increase by fifty percent. Yes. That's, so you shouldn't touch that. Right. 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 But it, but the chance but the chance of actually getting that cancer is 0.1%. Right. Yeah. So it so, goes up to 0.2%. Yeah. Yes. So, I mean... Yes. Relative versus absolute. Yeah. So there's probably, a whole yeah. lot of things where we do need to think. And unfortunately, the press doesn't help. The politicians don't help. Mm -hmm. I mean, you hear people making all sorts of weird announcements. I mean... If people thought a little bit more, we wouldn't have had the result with Brexit that mm -hmm. the the, elect, the referendum did. Mm -hmm. And so, so, critical thinking skills are highly highly transferable, and and can it even be a bit of a superpower to 
to people well, can yes. seem like a superpower if, uh, <laughs> because you, uh, you 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 won't get sucked into a lot of things that people get sucked into. Yeah. What if you were say in your mid forties and wanting to make a career change or something along those lines? What what if, well, you, if you were in your mid forties and I don't know you decided that the academic world wasn't for you or if you were well that's well in, in a way that's roughly what I did I was yeah. mid thirties right but not uh, right. and and it was a career change right. Apart from changing country, the so decision was to make a career change. Mm-hmm. So again, I'd say, what career change do you want? You've always got to have a plan B of some kind, because what if it doesn't work out? But you had no plan B when we, what? We, when we moved, uh, once you made the decision. Not really, mm-hmm. but... That was a big risk. Mm-hmm. That was a risk because if we'd gotten into serious health problems, mm-hmm. right. uh, so thinking back, I'm, I'm now now I'm sensible. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> but if the first thing is what you want to do, then look out how that can be done. There's a number of ways for most changes, and. Uh, then go do it. Uh, you had a discussion on one of your podcasts about uh, what was it? Regret. Mm-hmm. Regret versus disappointment. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And yes, you can be disappointed because you did something and didn't work out. But if you don't do that something, mm-hmm. you'll regret never having tried it. Mm-hmm. And that, if I were thinking. 30s, 40s, I want to do something different, you'd probably be in a position that you've got to hedge your bets a bit, have some money in the bank, and make some savings so that you can uh, so that you can take a risk and not collapse entirely. Mm. Uh, and that takes a little bit of organizing, but... It can be done. The other thing is you may be sorry you never did anything. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Uh, last one is perhaps a a difficult one, or maybe maybe an easy one. <laughs> Do you have a a set of rules or like a personal philosophy or a certain code of things that you've developed that that uh, you continue to go back to? I don't think I have it explicitly. Okay. I've never sat down and written down these are my guiding principles so we've got to dig them out dig them out on the basis of what we've done yes you they're do there but you they you have you know they, they, I, they obviously are there because you see what one does but I think among the things that matter is try to be nice mm-hmm try to understand and sometimes very difficult where others are coming from mm-hmm. and that's very difficult to do and I'm quite opinionated on some things but I know I shouldn't be um, I I think I have a strong feeling of what's right and what's wrong mm-hmm. not everyone might agree with my judgments but I've developed a, you don't do this and it's not because somebody told me not to do this. It's because you don't do this. Mm. Or you do do this. Mm. Be loyal to your friends within limits. We don't talk about mm. Trump loyalism. Mm-hmm. Uh, so try to keep your word. Mm-hmm. Uh, don't shortchange people. Mm-hmm. Don't cheat. Mm-hmm. I can't think of very much more okay. because I haven't written it down, but <laughs> yeah. it's, I think it's important, I mean, respect competence. And I'd say as well, sorry, I was forgetting this, work reasonably hard at what you're doing, hmm. or maybe too hard. Hmm. I have been accused of workaholism, so. <laughs> okay. Okay, this has been 
fantastic. Is there <laughs> anything know. that you didn't get a chance to mention that? No, you... I had some notes I'd made before. I think we covered I think we everything. We covered them all. There was something when you talk about perhaps talking about things, but uh, no, I think everything there is done. I could have given you much more history about Argentina, but I think people aren't interested. Well, people, or they can look it up. Yeah, um, I can. I can look up some references if you want. Mm -hmm. We can put those things in the show notes. So, not okay. A problem. Well, this has been wonderful. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. Well, uh, I love been, you very much. It's been an in, an interesting experience. Thank you for Thank the chance. You. Okay. <laughs> okay. Gracias. All right, everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. I am so grateful for the opportunity to share the conversation with you. Thank you very much for listening. And I wish you guys all the best. Feel free to connect and reach out if you have any thoughts or comments. And we'll be back soon. Until then, and as always, don't forget, risk is life. <laughs>